Welcome to Bethel Family Worship Center. If you're looking for something fresh, real, and powerful in your life, you've come to the right place. Connect with us on social media to get live stream service notifications, podcast, and up-to-date information on upcoming events. We're so glad you've decided to join us here at Bethel Family Worship Center for a life-transforming message and would love to hear how God is impacting your life through this ministry. So share your experience with us in the comments below. Also, if you want to be a part of what BFWC is doing in the city of Indianapolis and beyond, you can contribute financially by visiting bfwc.net forward slash giving and choose the option that works best for you. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Asking for things are not always easy. Sometimes it's hard for us to ask for help. We need a little gas money. We reluctant to ask anybody for help unless we're a college student we don't mind asking <laughs> most people when you ask them how are you doing the response is oh I'm good all is well yeah praise the Lord I'm just walking in favor and all of that is wonderful but there are parts of us that decline asking for help because we don't want anyone to think that we don't have our stuff together. And then there are people who ask outrageous things, um, almost like they're not even thankful for what they already have. They want more. Now, don't look down your row, but we all know somebody that just, you can't satisfy them. They want more. They want more. They want more. Sometimes when we ask, we ask amiss. We ask for the wrong thing. Instead of direction, we ask for, for things. And asking God for stuff rather than asking him for purpose. We ask for wins instead of principle. And today, if God will help me, I want to speak to our destiny. Let us pray. Father, I pray that you would anoint these lips of clay and anoint our hearts of flesh. Bring to us spirit understanding that is full of life. That we would become the people you designed for us to be. And that 2023 would be our year of awe and wonder. That a miracle will happen in our life. And I'm going to praise you today like it's already happened. And thank you today because I know that you've already spoken. And all of God's people say, Amen. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 20. I've been sharing with you from the four Gospels these last few weeks. Matthew chapter 20, a message that I want to speak about mother. The Bible talks to us in chapter 20, in verse 20, on down to verse 22. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons, and she knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request, he asked. She replied, in your kingdom... Please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus answered by saying to them, not just to her, but to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Notice their reply. Oh, yes. We are able. You know, you'll lie on a resume to get the job. Do you have experience in Microsoft Word and Excel? Oh, yes. I play hangman. Uh, does Candy Crush count? I... He asked the question back to them, are you able uh, to drink 
from the cup I'm about to drink, the cup of suffering. And their response immediately, without hesitation, they opened their mouth before they could think and said, oh yes, we are able. Now I want you to look at this passage as they keep it there for a minute. When I read of Jesus' response to this mother, I can't help but think that Jesus might just have been, allow me to uh, speculate here, that he might just have been a tad aggravated at the timing of her question. You know, questions aren't bad. Questions aren't wrong, but you can ask a question at the wrong time. Are you here? And Jesus has, in the scene that we're reading about, he has called his disciples apart to deliver them not only some very important news, but disturbing news. News that would grieve them. News that would confuse them. And he tells them, I'm about to be crucified. They're going to scourge me. They're going to beat me. They're going to crucify me. And I know you've been following me for three years, and we've been together nonstop for three years, but I want to prepare you. I'm about to die. And think about the timing of what Jesus is saying. Feel in that very moment this morning that Jesus is being so transparent with these helter-skelter, ragtag group of disciples that he called affectionately his inner circle, the disciples, and he divulges to them that my future's not looking good. I'm gonna go through a process that is gonna be so painful Paint more pain than you've ever seen before. And I want to share with you in this moment what that's going to look like. They're going to scourge me. They're going to mock me. They're going to beat me. They're going to kill me. I'm leaving you. And in the middle of that conversation, in the middle of that heavy moment, in the middle of everyone hearing the master speak, here comes this woman. He's just about ready to tell his disciples the details of it all. He tells them, I'm going to die. Here she comes with her two boys saying, excuse me, Mr. Jesus. Before you die, can you give a sister a hookup? She walks to Jesus and says, before you get out of here, I want to be sure that my sons, who are the sons of Zebedee, I've got to name them for you, that they end up sitting on your right hand and on your left hand in your kingdom. I need a hookup. I want to make sure that my children have every advantage available to them before you leave here. Now, she's not a bad woman. She's a good woman. In fact, uh, if you know her name, her name is Salome. And that's kind of how we say it in English. She is the wife of Zebedee. We know that Zebedee is a wealthy man. He is a influential man in the community. He owns his own fisher business. He's affluent. And she's faithful to the ministry of Jesus herself. She is a believer in Jesus. In fact, she's one of the women who ministered to Jesus. And yet when it comes to her kids, there's a struggle between who she is maternally and who she is spiritually. Let that sit there for a minute. When it comes to her children, She's struggling between her maternal instinct and her spiritual understanding. And I want to elaborate for a minute because not just the mother, but even most parents, we can become bossy, territorial, and pushy when it comes to our children. 
where we now struggle between paternity and spirituality. We know what the Spirit tells us to do, but there's this parental side of us that says, I'm going to do what I want to do. And Jesus asks her and makes the statement to her and says, you don't even know what you are asking. And so I want you to ask this question to yourself and write this down. Are you asking for something that is not in his will for you to have? Because we all have questions. (laughs) We've had our grandchildren all week long while our daughter and son are at law were in Hawaii living their best life, (laughs) getting sunburnt, came home so they could peel all over us, and they enjoyed themselves. And keeping their grandbabies 24-7 for nearly seven days, I have been asked, Papa, my name has been said so many times. It got to the point that instead of just saying Papa, now he hits me and says Papa. <laughs> Papa. I'm asked question after question. And I have to patiently pace myself. Come on now. So that I can, with great love, say my name one more time. I, I mean. We all have questions. Sometimes we ask the question at the wrong time. Oh my. So the question I'm asking you, are you asking for something that is not in God's will for you to have? And I would dare say all of us in this room have pushed, pushed on it till we have aggravated God about it so much that now we have convinced ourselves that this is the will of God. Mm. And God don't have to punish us by sending a plague. If God was a punisher, which he's a lover of our soul, by the way, he wouldn't have to send a plague to deal with me. I think all he'd have to do is just step back. Go ahead. You want it that bad? I'm preaching to somebody this morning. The general question is, are you asking for something that's not in his will for you to have? And on Mother's Day, the specific question is, have you taken motherhood too far? Are you mothering grown children? These aren't little boys that are out here skipping around, James and John. These aren't babies, toddlers, that you have to take them by the hand and lead them to the dinner table, lead them to the restroom. These are grown men. What are grown men doing? Being drug around by their mother. And that's what's wrong with society now. We got too many grown men who are still being drug around. Oh, this is not going to be a good Mother's Day. I I know you want me to preach about Hannah or something like that, but I'm going to get up in somebody's business today. When does a mother have to back up? When does a mother have to turn it over to Jesus and say, Lord, I brought them as far as I can bring them. I've taken them as far as I can take them. The rest is in your hands. I gotta gotta put them in your hands. And if you don't do that, you're gonna spend the rest of your aging life 
dragging your grown children around trying to make their story turn out the way you had in mind. I'm going to make sure, boo-boo, you make the elite traveling team. I'm going to make sure that you beat out all the other little kids in Little League. I'm going to make sure you live out my, I mean, your childhood dream. I want you to understand that there is a difference between mothering and manipulation. And we can't even talk about or even broach the subject until you begin to address that sometimes you can see yourself through a very narrow prism who you are to them and you lose sight of who you are to you. If all you are is a wife and a mother, then you have missed a lot. Because before you were a wife and before you were a mother, you were a woman. Come on, somebody. Are there any real women in this room? Oh, I got to ask the question. Are there any real women in this room? It's a sad day that I even have to ask a question. Are there any real women today in this messed up, wicked, evil, satanic world where people believe a lie and are damned? Maybe I just tell you I need some real women to stand up on your feet and give God praise that you a woman. Look over at another woman and say, girl, we in this together. Let me tell you what real, about real women. You are more than the job you do. You are more than the children you had. You are more than the ring on your finger. And stop defining your success by your relationships. Come on, somebody. Let me give somebody a wake-up call this morning. With no husband, with no kids, with no respect, with no flowers, and no cards, you are still God's woman. You are still called according to his purpose. And I know you got to learn. You better learn how to clap for yourself when nobody else will clap for you. I need to say something about this woman named Salome. Why is she dragging her grown children around? And furthermore, why is she following her grown children around? Why is she trying to manipulate their life? This woman is dragging these kids in here as if they are not already blessed. Jesus has already picked them. He has already esteemed them. He included them. He brought those two boys with him to the Garden of Gethsemane. He took those two boys to the Mount of Transfiguration. He carried them everywhere with him and mama is still trying to find a hookup for these two grown boys. And I was just wondering, Jesus, before you die, could you give my boys a position, one on your left and one on your right? And Jesus says, woman, you don't even know what you are asking. He is addressing this woman, and Jesus, you have to remember, he had the most amazing mother of his own, Mary, the mother of Jesus, an amazing mother who withstood the scorn of an entire city, the controversy of, of, of her intended to tell the world that she was now pregnant by a ghost. Come on, somebody. Isn't that what she said? She was so committed to her cause she got preg was pregnant and rode on the back of a donkey. She was so committed to her cause that when there was no place for them in a, in a, in a, in a hotel, she went in.
went and gave birth in a stable and wrapped her baby up in swaddling clothes and held him just the same and loved him just the same and nurtured him just the same but she was a mother on the run my god let me preach in here today when they were trying to kill her baby this mother said not my baby you're not gonna have my baby she carried him on down into egypt because she was a mother on the run she took him there for two years and said devil you can't have my child my god she was a mighty mother are there any mighty mothers in this room today who have prayed over your children laid your hand on their forehead anointed them with oil and said devil you can't have my baby you can't have my children you're not gonna have my seed line it's not gonna live in this house i'm not gonna stand for it i am a mother that is on the run oh can i preach here you've lived in bad neighborhoods but you raise good kids because you said devil you can't have my children i will fight you <laughs> a real mom won't compete with her child but fight for her child don't make me cut you and yet at the age of 12 Jesus disappears from his mother and he tells her Woman, I must be about my father's business. Excuse me. What'd you just say? I was raised in a home. You didn't talk back. Amen. I, got, I was raised in a home where if you talk back, you got knocked out. Now, I know that some of you in your... Old oh, pastor, don't say that. When you talk back, they didn't reward you with a new phone. Boo boo don't need a new phone. Boo boo needs their hind end tore up because they prideful, disrespectful, won't mind nobody. Turn over to your neighbor and say, boo-boo needs a, a bust on the hind end. That's what boo-boo needs. <laughs> Woo, it's quiet in here. I know. Send all your email to Pastor Wayne. He, he can handle it. He says, I must be about my father's business. And he cut the cord slowly at 12. And by the time he's 30, the cord has been cut so severely that she tries to get an audience with him in his ministry age. And they said, Jesus, your mother's at the door. And Jesus, who is the epitome of love, says, who is my mother? Your mom's out here trying to, she needs to talk to you. Who is my mother? And it's like Jesus was saying, why are you trying to attach me to where I've been when I'm trying to reach to where I'm going? I, I know you don't like this on Mother's Day, but when Jesus said, who is my mother? It's like he was saying, you keep trying to tie me to where I started. But at this stage in my life, I am so focused on my purpose that I have to do what I was called to do. And you keep trying to pull me back to where I was. Who is my mother? But he showed me something that as children get older, they, they never stop appreciating you. They never stop being nice to you. They should never stop respecting you. They should never stop honoring you. As they live out their life, they should be respectful and honoring even if they don't agree with you. 
We know Jesus loved his mother. I know he did because he stopped dying to talk to her. He stopped dying to, take, to tell John, take care of my mother. Take care of my mother, John. Anytime that you would just stop dying on a cross to make sure that your mom is good, that thinks something about a grown child's responsibility ought to be to take care of their mother. My God, I gotta preach to all of you that are in dysfunction, can't stand your mother, and she can't stand you. You better get your act together. My God, Jesus, stop dying to take care of her. You ought to never get so high and so big that you disrespect your mama. Jesus was on the cross dying and still he was respecting his mama. It's the only thing that God said. It is the only commandment that God said. If you obey it and honor your father and your mother, I will add years to your life. I'll give you more years if you'll just shut your mouth about your mom. That's hard to preach. But in our text, he says, I want you to understand about the process, Salome. I'm getting ready to go through some things. And as I start going through them, it's going to escalate quickly. They're going to mock me. They're going to scourge me. And then they're going to crucify me. And all of you that are taking notes, I want you to write this down. It's not in your PowerPoint. They're going to mock me. That's verbal. Some of you know what it is to be mocked, made fun of. He said, they're going to mock me. That's verbal. Then he said, they're going to scourge me. That's physical. That's beatings. And then he said, thirdly, they're going to crucify me. They're going to kill me. They're going to mock me verbally. They're going to scourge me physically. They're going to crucify me and kill me. I want you to write this down that whenever God gets ready to promote you, there will always be an escalation of trouble. And I don't know who that's for, but it was worth coming on a holiday to get it. Whenever God is getting ready to promote you, there will always be an escalation of trouble. He said, they're going to mock me then they're going to move to the second phase. They're going to scourge me. Then they're going to move to the next phase. They're going to crucify me. And what's worse is he says, it will start amongst my own people. Your own family will treat you worse than a stranger. Mm, I feel like we're digging up something this morning. It's going to start in my own family. They're going to talk about me behind my back. They're going to belittle me. They're going to mock me. He said, and then they're going to turn me over to the Gentiles, and it'll get worse. So whenever the enemy knows that you have a destiny, he will always send a distraction to stop you from getting to your destiny. I just said something to somebody. And the distraction will always escalate before it gets better. It'll keep getting worse. It'll keep getting worse. They're gonna mock me, they're gonna scourge me, and they're gonna crucify me. Why? Because the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. It always gets worse before it gets better. I didn't want to preach this this morning, but this is what the Holy Ghost said to preach. You have to understand that when it's all said and done, are you sure you can handle the process before you ask me for the promise? Can you handle the process before you ask 
Don't even ask me for the promise if you can't live up to the process. If you're going to quit every time somebody says something about you. If you're going to throw your hands up and be offended and leave the church and leave your job. How many people quit job after job after job after job and it's always the boss's fault and it's always the co-worker's fault. They don't ever want to take responsibility. I've got to march around this city. They don't ever want to talk about what they are doing to add to their own demise and their own all. Before you ask me for the promise, can you handle the process? Because I'm not going to let you sit in my seat until you have suffered with me. And all these frivolous Christians that want the promise, but not the process. And yeah, you heard me say that in this Pentecostal church. Jesus says, You cannot reign with me if you don't suffer with me. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but I do know this is not a regular Mother's Day. I'm telling you to whom much is given, much is required. And before you ask God for anything, you better look in the cup. You better look in the cup. Because Jesus said, you're talking about the place you want to sit And I'm talking about the drink I got to drink. I'm talking about the cup. You talking about a seat. You want a position. You want a title. I'm talking about a process. I'm about to go through something. And you got the nerve to come up in here with your motherhood and your manipulating self trying to get me to give you something. I'm not even going to let you know what it is until you can look in this cup. You talking about what can the church do for me? And God said, what can you do for the church? Well, they better have a good child care and they better have good kids ministry and that worship better be on point and I better be able to praise the Lord and throw a shoe and I be able to play my tambourine. Wow, hogwash. Can I tell somebody, it ain't about you, boo-boo. It's about the mission. And if you already saved, we shouldn't have to sing your song anyhow. You should have already sung it before you got here. Happy Mother's Day. (laughs) You're so interested in about where you're going to sit, you haven't looked in the cup to see what you got to drink to get it. Uh, I'm almost done before you get hateful. (laughs) This is what amazed me about this text, about this mama. Be careful what you ask for. You're asking, Salome, I want you to know what you're asking. This question is asking for your children to die. I can't put them in a position if they can't handle this cup. And then he says back to them, and and let me just break this baptism for all you new Bible scholars. (laughs) Baptism is about death. It's not about water and formula. I just made somebody mad. Because you just... You want the position without the cup. Process. You overlook the process in every area of your life. Oh, anyhow, Jesus says, I have a baptism. Isn't that what the text says? To be baptized with. He said, I have a baptism to be baptized with. He's not talking about water. He had already come up out of the water. He's talking about what the water temperified, which is death, which is the grave. And when he told him, you got to drink the cup and you got to go through that baptism, they said, we got this. We can do it. And you know what that illustrates to me? We underestimate what it takes to get to the next level. They were caught up 
with the allurement ooh, of who sits on the right and who sits on the left, but we have not looked into the cup to inspect the cross, which is the path to the position. We want the promise without the problems. We want acknowledgement without the agony. We want riches without work. Talk to me, somebody. We want fame without loneliness. We want pleasure without pain. But I'm sorry, he says, Salom, you don't even know what you are asking. Before you ask God for a chair, be sure to look in the cup. Before you ask for the chair, look into the cup because between you and the chair, there will always be a cup. And this mother knew not what she asked for because she was distracted by the attention for the position. I gotta get my babies where they need to be. She never understood the pain that goes along with every position. Write this down, every position has its pain. Every position has its pain. Oh, I'm glad you're a homeowner. That's a great position but it has some pain with it. Somebody had got to clean the gutters. Somebody got to change the furnace on the filter furnace, the filter on the furnace. <laughs> Somebody got to mow the yard. Somebody got to shovel the snow. Mm -hmm. Somebody got to clean the windows. Somebody had to clean the toilets. Somebody got to wash the dishes. I'm glad you got a position, but there's some pain with it. There's some issues that you got to deal with it when you have the position. Well, I'm glad you own your own car. That's wonderful. Praise the Lord for you. That's nice, shiny. It's nice and shiny. You got the car. You're going to need some gas, though. You're going to need to keep oil in it. You're going to have to go to JR's Tires and get you some tires on it. You're going to need to change the battery and you're going to have to remember that it's illegal to drive without insurance. See, we want the position without the pain. We want to sit in the seat, but we don't want to drink from the cup. And when Jesus told her how much it was going to cost, when he told her the cost of it, you know, she was in a place where she, she didn't know he was going to tell her that the check he would get would to die. They had to die for it. When he told her what it cost, they said, oh, well, we got this. Surely we can handle this. We got this. And I thought to myself, really? Really? You can handle this? Your mother is manipulating and bringing you all around trying to network you drop names and you laying on the couch with your head in her lap with your thumb in your mouth you a grown man mothers who do that are selfish because it's more about you getting your need you need to be needed you need to be Ooh, I'm going to get hate mail. Happy Mother's Day. Can you handle the cup? Oh, we got this. Really? You got this? James, John, thumb suckers? Bottle drinking? Pacifier wearing? Diaper changing? You got this? He said, before I get to the resurrection, I will be mocked and scourged and they will kill me. And before I take my seat today, I felt like the Lord wanted me to also to speak to the people right now in your life, you are somewhere being mocked. Somewhere and someone in this place, you're being scourged. And they're trying to crucify you. The Lord told me that there are somebody here that would be here today that you are going through humiliation right now. They're trying to humiliate you. 
you're going through a mockery. Let me, let me testify for a minute. Many times in my life, my life has been a mockery. Many times, the things that I did publicly, I struggled with privately. Can I be real with you? What I'm saying is there were many times that I could pray with you about your sickness, but I couldn't pray for my own self. Can I be real with you? There have been times since I have started my journey with God when I was eight years old and I surrendered my life to the Lord. Until now, even during the ministry stage of submitting to the call of God in my life, many times in my life, life has mocked me. This is where the Holy Spirit would have me have you think this morning. How can you be so strong about this and so weak about that? Because it was a mockery. Are you here? Have you ever had something happen to you that mocked everything you stood for? In 2017, yes, I'm going to tell it again. When they said I had cancer, it mocked me. I prayed for other people to be healed. Couldn't even pray for myself. Life was mocking me. Have you ever had something happen to you that mocked everything you believed? And then people, I thought you was a Christian. I thought you was a man of faith. I thought you was a woman of power. I thought you were counseling other people's marriages. I thought, I thought, I thought. I want to talk to the people that have been mocked this morning. When you're running a counseling center for teenage girls and your own daughter gets pregnant out of wedlock, and life mocks you. When you're helping your girlfriend with her marriage and your husband leaves you, life mocks you. You're going to get mocked sometimes. You're going to get beat sometimes. And if you never get beat, you'll never understand how to win. Maybe we would tell sports students, if you never get beat, you'll never respect the game. If you never get beat, you'll never understand who you are. I'm talking to people today, maybe you're in a period where life has beat you down. And you almost didn't even come to church today because you've been beat up. I'm preaching to somebody. You don't have to make any noise. I, I'm preaching to somebody. Write this down. You can be mocked in private and you can be beaten in private, but you can only be crucified in public. Jesus says to Salome and to the disciples because he ends up addressing them. They're going to mock me. They're going to beat me. And then I'm going to go through public humiliation. They're going to crucify me and nail me so I can't get out of it. They're going to strip me naked and expose me to the world. And the terrible thing about being stripped naked is that it always creates the sense of shame. Even though the shame is foolish because your nakedness is no different than the person's nakedness on the same row you're sitting on. Your issues are no different than mine. Your secrets are no different than mine. Your situations are no different than mine. I'm trying to help you think this morning. But when somebody strips you and puts you out on public display on Facebook, you feel like you're in a situation all by yourself. Is there anybody that's ever felt like you all by yourself, Celine? 
Is there anybody that has felt like nobody was there? Jesus said, they're going to mock me. They're going to beat me. They're going to crucify me. But then he said, when they get through crucifying me, let me tell you what's going to happen next. Tell your neighbor, my story's not over. Say it out loud, my story's not over. After you have suffered a while, if you can take it, them talking about you behind your back, mm. if you can handle it and let it roll off of you, if you can handle them mocking you, if you can handle them beating you down sometimes, if you can stand being crucified by people, I come to tell you the Bible said, weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. Oh, I heard him say when the going gets tough, the tough get going. My God, I know it's painful. I know you want to throw that marriage away because you're tired of each other. But hold on a little further. You have to endure the chastening of the Lord. You've got to go through the mockery, go through the scourging, and go through the crucifying. And when you're publicly humiliated, don't give up. Because if you hang on, Sunday's coming. Resurrection's coming. I'm crying right now, but I will rise again. I'm hurting right now, but I will rise again. I'm bruised, but I will rise again. Stand to your feet and give Jesus some praise in this house. He said, Salome, be careful what you ask for. Because you're asking for death for your children. God sent me with a word today on this Mother's Day to tell us all, male and female, there's only two genders, male and female. And he said, you got to look into the cup before you ask him for the promise you got to go for the process first the cross is the path to position you got to die you got to die you got to die you don't get everything you want you're not spoiled you don't get everything you want if you're married, leave that woman at work alone. Why are you drinking alcohol when everybody in your family has a problem? And it, you think it's not going to affect you? It's not only going to affect you, it's going to affect your children and your children's children. Oh, you know, I'm so mature in the Lord. You haven't drunk from the cup yet where you have to die to your wants. Oh, I have to preach with my eyes closed, Pastor Hill. How many people in my counseling trying to help get victory want to come to church and shout on Sunday and live like hell all week long? You gotta hold on. You gotta live for God. We come into the end. Jesus is soon to return. We gotta live holy. We gotta do holy. We gotta be holy. The Bible said that without holiness, no one shall see the Lord. Without holiness, no man shall see God. Holiness is about the decisions you make, the priorities in your life. I'm not so much concerned about what other people are saying. I am more concerned about what he says. Is he pleased? 
Is he pleased? It's a dying process. And on this Mother's Day, I'm asking you to search your heart and ask yourself, man and woman, can I drink the cup? Would I be willing to? Because if you just want the position and you just want to have the Sunday experience, that's all it'll ever be. But if you want to drink the cup, you'll have to die to your flesh and die to your desires and to die to the things that tempt you. And you'll have to call your sponsor when you're tempted and you'll say, help pray for me right now. You have to call your mentor, your pastor, coach, and say, pray for me right now, I'm being tempted. I, I'm preaching to somebody. I don't want this thing to take me over. I don't want to die an early death. I don't want to bring humiliation to my family. I've got to die the death. So I'm going to ask you if you're able to drink the cup. And if that's the case, this isn't really, this is not the holiday-ish message that I wanted to preach. It's not the flowers and the, the perfume. It's... It's the hardcore die the death salon. Because if you don't die the death, James and John won't know how to die the death. I have to die as a parent to my desire and my will and my schedule and my agenda and put God first because even in the Ten Commandments, he said, you shall have no other gods before me. And if you've got to justify it and sneak to do it, and be secretive about it, then your life is not in the open. Your yea is not yea, and your nay is not nay, and thus there is the turmoil of your soul. You can blame the preacher, you can blame everybody, but God's trying to tell you to drink the cup. Drink the cup. Father, today I'm asking you to teach us, Lord, how to operate in grace and how to grow in your spirit. And God, I know that you have birthed us for such a time as this and a time of purpose and that you have a plan for our life and that you are guiding us to our identity. And our destiny is wrapped up in who you created us to be. So I would say, Lord, I yield to you on this Mother's Day that I will be careful what I ask for, but knowing that when I ask, I'm willing to do what is required of me, that I may please you. And I pray, God, that you would speak to every home and every heart and every family in this place. If you're here today and the Lord is speaking to you about your eternal soul, your walk with him, your relationship with a loving Father, Jesus, I want you to know you can trust him he will not fail you. He will not abandon you. He will not reject you in your hour of need. You can trust the Lord. Jesus will not only be your friend, he will be a father to you. And he will embrace you right where you are. Our prayer team is moving into place. And if you're here today and you would say, that's me. I, I am in need of a savior. I need Jesus in my life today. I want to restore my relationship to him. Before I ever leave this place today, I'm going to make sure that I have put my walk with God first. Not with others, but with Him first. And as you come this morning, I want you to just come and present yourself for prayer, that your prayer team will pray with you. That whatever the need is in your life, you may be mocked this morning, you may be bruised today, you may be scourged and even attempted to be humiliated but God's got you today so I want to ask you to come for salvation I want you to come for deliverance I want you to come for healing it don't matter what you come for it's nobody's business but yours but I want you to just to make your way and come would you do that now as we say thank you so much for joining us online today we hope you've had a powerful experience. We want to take this time to personally help you navigate the next steps in becoming connected. If you've made a decision for Christ today, need prayer, or want more information about our church, you can visit our website at bfwc.net. Also, if you didn't get a chance to give online during today's message and would like to contribute financially, 
you can visit us at bfwc.net forward slash giving and choose the option that works best for you. We look forward to hearing from you and God bless.